What's up guys, today I have an amazing video for you where we're gonna be talking about all of your most frequently asked questions on the COVID-19 vaccination. I brought an amazing guest, Dr. Seema Yasmin, who's not only a doctor, she's an epidemiologist, a journalist, she's the director of research and education at the Stanford Health Communication Initiative. Dr. Yasmin, thank you so much for being here. We're really excited to have you. I'm really excited. Thanks so much, Dr. Mike, for having me on today. Everyone is hearing about the vaccine. When do you think that we can actually start giving this vaccine to everybody outside of frontline healthcare workers and those who are over the age uh, specified by the CDC. As of mid to late December, we've got two different COVID-19 vaccines with an emergency use authorization in the US, but more coming, I think, in the next few weeks. The point at which you can start to extend vaccination to many more people, the tens of millions that we need vaccinated, could be a few months away. There are some projections that it could be around April time. I think saying spring to summer is fair because bear in mind that at least for the two vaccines we have currently available, it's it's not just a one and done shot. You're having to go back three or four weeks later, depending on which one you got. And even then, it's only one to two weeks after your second shot that your body's actually developed that kind of immunity that's going to protect you from getting sick. Should there be a preference to which ones our country should be buying? Are you allowed to mix the vaccines? Some people may get a choice like, hey, we have this buffet of vaccines. I think for some, realistically, there won't be so much choice. But now I think when you are told you are eligible for a particular vaccine, I would roll up your sleeve and go for what's available. We don't have any data on mixing and matching. So that means if your first shot is the Pfizer-BioNTech shot, you should get that as your second shot three weeks later. If your first shot was the Moderna one, that should be your second shot four weeks later. We're still humans. Errors are going to be made. I just read a press yeah. article of um, a pharmacist, I believe, that was given multiple doses of the vaccine accidentally because they didn't know it came in a multi-dose vial. Oh, and things gosh. like that are part of real world applications. Human. These things are gonna happen, yeah. We shouldn't be set back by one piece of bad news. And I know the press a lot of times will do that and make it seem like something is horrible. I want people to know that some people don't feel very well. Some have to take a day off work the next day. If you know that, it's less scary going in should it happen to you. However, the flip side of that is that every single time someone in the on the planet has had an allergic reaction to one of these COVID-19 vaccines, it's become a big headline. And I know people that are like, oh, I'm just really scared. And I'm like, hold on. A few million people <laughs> at this point have received these vaccines and about eight, I think at my last count, you know, less than a dozen have developed an allergic reaction. You are totally allowed to be scared of that. Allergic reactions are scary, but all of them were fine. They got treated. And this is the very reason that, you know, after you get uh, any vaccine for, for the most part, you're not allowed to go home straight away, even though you want to get back to work or whatever. You're told, no, please sit in the waiting room for the next 15, 30 minutes in case you have a reaction. Because this vaccine was produced rather quickly, we haven't had long-term side effect research available on it, simply because the time hasn't been there. Is there anything in your mind that would suggest that there are serious long-term side effects? If you look at the history of vaccines and reactions to vaccines, the vast majority, if not nearly all of them, occur within the days after you get vaccinated or at most about four to five weeks after vaccination. So we've got safety data beyond that amount of time, right? We've got at least eight weeks of safety data. But the other thing to bear in mind is that we haven't just dropped the ball now that we have emergency use authorization of these vaccines, we are continuing to monitor people for years out. And also another thing is, remember, we're prioritizing, especially in the UK, older people to get vaccinated. And so we're going to be hearing stories, and I want to give everyone a heads up of this, of folks saying, well, my granddad was 85, he got the COVID-19 vaccine, and then he died the next month. The thing is, if you are in your 80s, you have a one in 10, one in 12 roughly chance of dying in the next year. And so just because you're in that high priority group to get the vaccine, it might look like increased deaths occurring in that population. How does this vaccine work? And why is it different than the flu vaccine or other vaccinations that we've heard so much about? So all vaccines are trying to do the same thing. They're trying to give your immune system a heads up to be prepared should you ever be exposed to the actual virus. 
coronavirus. With these two mRNA vaccines, so there's one made by Pfizer-BioNTech, one made by Moderna, they are new technology. They're doing something really amazing where they're giving your body a little piece of RNA, which is the genetic code that your body needs for your own cells to start making little tiny fragments of this new coronavirus. So your body's not making the whole virus, you can't get the infection from the vaccine, but your body gets the code to make just the spike protein. And then by making that protein, your immune system sees it, takes note, it's like, okay, gonna get ready, should we ever get exposed to this? In the meantime, that RNA that got injected into you from the vaccine, it disappears quite quickly, it's very fragile. Reiterating what you said, because it's so important, you're not making the full virus, so you cannot get COVID-19 by getting the vaccine. The incredible thing about these newer vaccines is that they don't contain any portion of live, weakened or dead virus, which is how some other vaccines work. What are the ingredients of the vaccine and are they trustworthy? Some of the questions I get asked the most are, is there anything toxic in there? And is there aluminum or aluminum, as you would say in the US? The list actually of ingredients in these vaccines is publicly available. You can go online and see it. It's quite a short list and there is no mercury and no aluminum in them. And the important part is just because there's a chemical name to a substance, it doesn't make it automatically yeah. bad or dangerous. And on the flip side, if something is claimed to be all natural, doesn't mean that it's all safe. How effective do we think this vaccine is gonna be? Let's not talk real world, let's talk based on the evidence we have thus far. In the clinical trials, in those phase three clinical trials, which was 44,000 people for the Pfizer-BioNTech trial and about 30,400 for the Moderna trial, these vaccines were found to be very efficacious. And I'll say efficacious, right? Not effective, because we're talking about in a clinical trial but around 94 to 95% efficacious. That was way more than we expected. And specifically, when we're talking about those numbers of efficacy, we're talking about the reduced likelihood of a person becoming sick with COVID-19. We're not talking about a reduced chance of getting the infection and therefore a reduced chance of spreading it to other people. That transmissibility part, that question about if I get this vaccine, am I less contagious? Unfortunately, the clinical trials we have so far did not seek to answer that question. That's something we're going to learn from the real world. How soon after we're vaccinated, both doses, are we considered protected to this 90, 95 percent? It takes one to two weeks for your body to build up that immunity against the virus. How many people need to get this vaccine in order for it to be considered like eradicated? We think about 70, maybe 75 percent or so of Americans would need to be vaccinated in order for us to achieve that herd immunity that we talk about, but it's still a, a big chunk. We're talking about three out of four people. How much will it cost? Do I need health insurance in order to be vaccinated? No cost to individuals, whether you are insured or you are not insured. The vaccines themselves can be quite expensive, but remember the billions it's cost to get us here that's largely taxpayer money. So we've paid for these. Now it's the government's job to distribute them fairly and to make sure everyone who needs a vaccine can get one. What are the official recommendations for who should get this vaccine? Are there groups that we recommend shouldn't take it? So right now I'm not seeing too many recommendations about who should be excluded from vaccination. There's some kind of gray areas, for example, around pregnant women, because unfortunately, and I think this is not great, but they weren't included in the clinical trials. And so it means pregnant women are kind of told, you can, if you want, talk to your doctor, weigh the risk of infection versus potential risk of vaccination, and then make up your mind. There's not very clear cut guidance. The other question that comes up is should groups who are immunocompromised not receive these vaccines? And actually we're saying you can receive these vaccines because they don't contain the virus like some other different kinds of vaccines do. And then what about children? Um, you know, generally they have fared better with this virus. They are still vectors for it and potentially can be spreading it. When you don't have that clinical trial data from children, it makes it really hard to say what you should do for children at large. The good news is Moderna is now recruiting for a clinical trial for its vaccine among 12 to 17 year olds. So I hope in the next few months that gives us that data about how should children be involved. This is so important to state here that the reason this uh, vaccine is being recommended for groups 16 and older is not because we have evidence that it's harmful 
for those who are under 16. It's because simply we do not have full efficacy and we haven't tested it in groups under the age of 16. And I think now is a really good time to talk about the difference between those who are truly anti-vax activists or anti-vaccine activists and those who are vaccine hesitant because they've heard something, they've read something that's potentially misinformation or disinformation. I'm so glad you worded it that way as well, Mike, because I think I try actually not to use the term anti-vaccine very much. The vast majority of people who are kind of a bit worried about these vaccines, they're not what people might call anti-vaxxers, they're vaccine yeah. hesitant. They're the kinds of folks who are like, yeah, my kids got all their childhood vaccines, normally get my flu shot. I'm just not too sure about these new ones. They seem to have been developed a bit quickly, those are the people we really need to be reaching out to. And actually, specifically that question about, wait, you told me normally it takes about 10 years yeah. on average to develop a vaccine, then how could it happen in 10 months? The question should be, why does it normally take us 10 years to develop a vaccine that's way too long? What's happened in the last 10 months is proof of what can get done, how amazing science can be done, and what achievements you get when you have international collaboration and literally tens of billions of dollars thrown at the problem. But the other piece of context is, I know this virus is brand new, but the researchers who brought us these vaccines have been working on this kind of scenario for years. So that University of Oxford group, for example, have been working on a vaccine for Pandemic X a virus potentially that comes along that is brand new. What they've been working on for a few years is how do we get 10 steps ahead of that so that when this gnarly infection arises, we have to do very little work to make a vaccine. This is an international effort where everyone is on the same page. We're cutting out a lot of bureaucratic red tape, to put it simply, right? Like in getting yeah. the funding. Why? Because our economy was threatened. Anytime you threaten the economy or money, the problem usually gets solved a lot quicker yeah. in a more efficacious yeah. way. I think this antibody conversation has been really confusing to the general public because A, we can test for the antibodies. We don't know what the cutoff is to know that you're immune. We don't know yeah. how long it lasts. We kind of have this arbitrary three-month cutoff. The kind of immunity that you get from some vaccines can be stronger and longer lasting than what you get from natural infection. We also don't have amazing antibody tests. Some of them are not the most specific and the most sensitive. So there's been a lot of confusion around who's been exposed. I've actually had some debates with fellow physician friends of mine who I've basically taken a, a firmer stance in saying that I don't see a value for an individual to go get tested for antibodies. Do you agree with I that? agree. Whenever you order a test, it's your responsibility to follow up on the result, med school one-on-one, -on -one, and also think about what's actionable. We don't have a full understanding yet of what level of antibodies truly confer resistance, truly confer protection against this virus. So to me, there are still many unknowns. It's interesting from like a theoretical research perspective to gather that data yeah. now. But in terms of telling a patient what to do or not to yeah. do, I don't think antibodies change that conversation. If you have questions about the vaccine, drop your questions down below. If you have any hesitations, drop them down below. I'm gonna be trying to be more active in this comment section versus others, because I know a lot of folks do have questions. Dr. Yasmin, thank you so much for being here for all the work that you've done, not only with COVID-19, but all the diseases you've investigated. Where can people follow you? Where can they stay up to date? Well, thank you so much for having me on today. Folks can follow me on Twitter at Dr. Yasmin and on Instagram at Dr. Seema Yasmin. Thank you for being here. And as always, stay happy and healthy.